everyone. I'm sorry for the slightly late start. That's just simply, I didn't notice what the time was. So I apologise for that. Um, welcome back to church. And a particular welcome if you haven't been here for a while. Not much has changed in this ancient church. <laughs> but it is so, so good to see you all. And so good to hear chatter before the um, start service. In, to prevent me forgetting, I published The Bands of Marriage between Amy Catherine Simpkins and David Luke Reeford Ganville, both single and of the parish of Alden Vaughan, but with a, connecting, a connection to this parish. These bands are for the first time of asking if any of you know any reason in law why these two persons may not marry one another, you must declare it now. Brilliant. I can now relax. <laughs> There's a slight deadline on that one. Today is Passion Sunday, and we begin to move towards the events of Good Friday, which in the words of the Archbishop revealed to us something that we wouldn't have expected, that God in Jesus Christ is wounded and broken. <coughs> that he's the one who suffers with us, the one who agonises and who understands the reality of anger and hurt, the God who puts himself at the mercy of his own creation, takes on all our humanity and knows the darkest, most painful, most vulnerable parts of what it is to be human. We've received a lot of responses so far from the parish survey and one of the things that's become apparent, which I think we knew, but it's moving to hear it in people's own words, is how very, very difficult this year has been. And so in this time of the Passion, as we think of Jesus' sacrifice for us on the cross, and the way in which he knows our frailties, and is able to walk alongside us, to help us carry the burdens that we fear may crush us, we pray that today, God this morning, will come close to each one of us as we bring our praise, our thanks, and our prayers. And so I hope you've each got a copy of the service in front of you. And we begin with our greeting. The Lord be with you. And also with you. And we pray together. Almighty, Almighty God, God, to whom all our hearts are all desires make, and, and from whom we are Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. And at the beginning of our service, we remember that God shows his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so let us call to mind our deliberate sins, our willfulness, and our negligence, and confess them to our Heavenly Father in penitence and faith. We pray together. Most merciful God, God Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are, and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. May the Father of all mercies cleanse us from our sins, and restore us in his image to the praise of glory of his name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And on the pew sheet, you have a copy of the Collect for today, Passion Sunday. So shall we pray it together? Most, Most merciful God, God, who by God the death and the resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, delivered and saved the world, Grant that by faith in him who suffered on the cross, 
we may triumph in the power of his victory. Through Jesus Christ, our Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one Lord, now and forever. Amen. And we're seated to listen to our Old Testament reading, which Diana is going to read to us. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me truly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words, and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Please would you stand. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. John. Glory, Glory to you. Lord. Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honour him. Now is my soul troubled, for what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd that stood there and heard it thought said that it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus answered, This voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. And he said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord. Please be seated. And I'm going to hand over to Tom. Great. It's lovely to be with you this morning. Got a tickly cough. It's been terrible over the last year to have a cough, hasn't it? Because you know how much staring you think it is. Quite fine, it's not that kind of cough, thank you. I think it's because I've already given seven months already this morning. Great. Well, it's lovely to, be, to see you all, and uh, isn't it good to be together in person? 
As we come to uh, this talk this morning, I just want to start by mentioning how some churches in their pulpits will have an inscription written on them, uh, something for the preacher to read, to be reminded of as they give their talk. We don't actually have one here. We don't have one on here. There is a script, an inscription on the um, portable lectern that I used this morning at All Saints at half past nine. It was lovely, lovingly given in memory of uh, a church warden, so it did have a little inscription on it. It's less lovely when you realise that we stole it from St. James's Church when we were there. It's fine, they do know about it. But some churches do have an inscription, and one of the verses that some churches have is a verse from this passage that we just heard from John's Gospel. Specifically, the end of verse 21, where it says, Sir, we want to see Jesus. And some churches will have that printed or scripted on their pulpit, so that when the preacher gets up to deliver their sermon, they're reminded that for all of their wonderful anecdotes, their fantastic illustrations, their hilarious stories about their cat or whatever it is, the thing which people really need is to see Jesus. That is what is at the heart of the Christian faith. Come and see the real, living, risen, historical Saviour. It's always been at the heart of the Christian faith, and it always must be. And it's there in our passage, Sir, we would like to see Jesus. And so the task of the preacher is not to stand up and give a list of do's and don'ts or a description of what a good life is in isolation from who Jesus is. We just stand up here and list off things to do or not to do. We just become moralists. There's no impetus, there's no conviction. It's simply a a list of things to make people feel guilty or proud. Actually, the heart of the Christian gospel is to come and see the glory of Jesus. And so churches have that little inscription on their pulpit to remind the preacher that what we must do is to show people the glory of Jesus. The way I was taught it with an illustration is to think when you ever used to stand up to preach holding up a big mirror, a full length mirror that completely hides the person who's holding it, and to angle it, as it were, up to heaven. And we know that heaven's not really up there in that sense, but to picture yourself angling a mirror so that as people see, as they listen, as they watch, what they get is not the preacher, but a reflection of the glory of Jesus that they can know for themselves, to angle that mirror. And that the test of faithful preaching, what you want from a preacher in a, a, preaching the word of God is not to come away and say, wow, what a great preacher. As much as that might puff up someone's ego and make them feel good about themselves, that's not actually what we want. We don't even really want people going away and saying, wow, what a great sermon. What we want is people going away saying, wow, what a great saviour. And so this morning I've got the one single point for you. One thing to remember, one thing to take away, one thing that I hope to communicate to you from the words, these inspired words of this passage, it's simply this. Come and see the glory of our crucified saviour. Come and see the glory of our crucified Saviour. As Jesus here in John chapter 12 is preparing his followers for what is about to happen. As soon as I said, this is Passion Sunday, we're moving forward through the Gospel, we're getting ever, ever closer to the events of Palm Sunday, through Holy Week, Good Friday and Easter Sunday. And here in John chapter 12, Jesus is continuing to prepare his disciples for what is about to happen. And when this inquiry comes, sir, we want to see Jesus, Jesus replies by saying that he is about to be glorified so that all can see his glory. He says the hour has come for the Son of Man, that means himself, to be glorified. Now on its own, that might sound quite exciting. If you were there with him up to this point and you didn't know what was about to happen, the idea that his hour of glorification was about to happen might thrill you. Think, yes, here we go, this is what it's all been building up to. All those miracles, all that wonderful teaching, all those prophecies, everything he's been talking about, the moment of glory has come, like the end of the World Cup final as the team lifts the trophy, or perhaps in their context, the Roman gladiator or general 
marching back into the city with the great spoils of war behind them, their moment of triumph and glory. And perhaps, if you don't know what's to come, when Jesus says, the hour has come for him to be glorified, there's this great picture of him winning a great victory, kicking out the Romans, establishing himself on the throne, perhaps shining like he did up the mountain for the transfiguration. His moment of glory is here. But very quickly, Jesus explains that this hour of glory is connected to his death. He goes straight on to say, Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. Jesus' moment of glory is his death. His death will glorify the Father's name. Now maybe it could have still been the case that there was a glorious death to come. In that culture, in the context of the time, they would have understood the idea of glorious death, of a, a great military leader at the front of their army taking a martyr's death in battle to win a great victory. That at least is a death which comes with glory. But in verse 33, Jesus says something to show them the kind of death he was going to die. He's going to be lifted up, literally hung up, pinned up from the earth on a cross. This death, which is somehow going to bring him glory, is physically tortuous, utterly humiliating, and deeply shameful, especially for a Jew. You see, back in Deuteronomy 21, in our Old Testament, the Jewish scriptures, it's very clear that it says, cursed is the one who is hung on a tree. So it feels like a mismatch. How can this be Jesus' hour of glory if what is about to happen is a shameful, painful, humiliating death on a criminal's cross? How does that possibly bring him glory? How does that glorify the Father's name? Or to put it even more frankly, what good is a crucified servant? Well, Jesus gives them and gives to us the answer which has two parts to it. Verse 30, Jesus said, having God's voice come and tell them that this was for his glory, Jesus said, that voice was for your benefit, not mine. In other words, you need to hear that what is about to happen, even though it looks on the outside to be a shameful, embarrassing, humiliating defeat, is in fact the moment when Jesus glorifies the Father because he's going to fulfill the plan that they had from the very beginning. This is his moment of triumph. It will look like one thing, but it will be achieving something completely different. In his death, two key things are going to be accomplished. Firstly, he says, it will bring judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. In John's Gospel, whenever he refers to the world, he doesn't mean the entirety of it, but he's very much thinking about the world as it is broken and damaged and marred by sin and evil and death. All that's wrong with the world. All that in the world stands against God and his lordship. Jesus is going to bring judgment on this world. All those horrible, painful, terrible things that have happened all the way through, Jesus is going to do something which will bring it to a definite end. A line in the sand. No more. Judgment falls on evil itself, the beginning of the end of death. And even the prince of this world, referring to Satan, the tempter, the great accuser, is going to be driven out through what Jesus does on the cross. You see, the only thing the devil ever has over us, actually, is to accuse us in the presence of God. God is a holy, perfect, uh, magnificent God. And we as unholy, imperfect people cannot be in God's presence. We cannot be with him now or forever. It's the continual story of the Old Testament. They had to go through all these rituals and processes just for one person or one day of the year to go into the Holy of Holies. And the devil, the only thing the devil has is to accuse, to say, look at this person, look at Tom, look at these things in his heart, look at these things that he's done, look at the way that he's a hypocrite. He stands up there looking all good and then actually you see you God, you know what he's like on Monday morning. You can't let him into heaven. It's all he's got accusations. 
my record of sin which creates a barrier with God. But if on the cross all of that sin is put on Jesus, then the devil has nothing left to accuse me with. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It is finished. It is done. It is paid for. He's done it. And so the evil one who had ruled this world in people like me and frankly people like all of us is driven out because on the cross Jesus has paid the price he's taken it on himself he's broken the hold that sin has over us the, the barrier literally torn in two from top to bottom that a, a people can be with their God now and forever because of what Jesus has done through his death which brings glory to him glory to God that's the first thing and the second thing that Jesus says is that when he is lifted up from the earth, when he dies on the cross, he will draw all people to himself. That through his death, with evil having been moved out of the way, sin paid for, nailed to the cross, now instead, Jesus draws to himself those who would believe in him. Draws people to the one who gives us life. Draws people to the God who we've rejected and yet who has not rejected us. As Jesus says, when that one seed dies, it produces many seeds. Through one man's death, many have life. Real life. Lasting life. Life that cannot be taken away. That is the glory of the crucified Saviour. He takes our place, bears our sin, cuts himself off from the Father that we would no longer be cut off. And instead gives us life, gives us hope, gives us the promise of his presence with us now and our place with him forever. Evil defeated, sin is no more, life is forever, joy eternal is ours. That is the glory of the hour. That is the glory of what Jesus is going to do. The glory of the crucified Savior. And yes, the call to follow him is a big one. He says, doesn't he, so clearly, anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. That is a tough ask. But the only way to do it is not for me or someone else to stand up here and tell you to do it. The only way to do it is to hold up that mirror that we can see for ourselves the love and the glory of this God who gave himself for us so that our hearts are warmed to want to follow him. And having come and seen the glory of Jesus, it's so natural for us to call others to come and see the glory of this crucified Savior. We can't make ourselves do it, but we can look in that picture of his glory and see this God who gave himself for us, who died for us, that we might have life. Come and see the glory of a crucified Saviour, evil defeated, life, hope, joy restored. I want to finish by just reading the words from a wonderful old hymn that you might know. And I think this hymn captures what I'm trying to say this morning about holding up a mirror to see the glory of Jesus. Not a list of do's and don'ts. Simply gaze upon the Saviour who died for you. And allow that to transform your heart, your mind, your hopes, your expectations, the whole of your life, and even your death, because you've seen the glory of the crucified Saviour. Bearing shame and scoffing rude, in my place condemned he stood. Sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah. What a Saviour. Lifted up was he to die. It is finished was his cry. Now in heaven exalted I. Hallelujah. What a Saviour. When he comes, our glorious King, all his ransomed home to bring, then anew this song will sing. 
Now again to come to lead us in our intercessions. Dear Lord, we thank you that you promised to, to hear us when we pray. Some gathered here at your table in your presence, and others at home in your presence too. Father, we pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Fill with your spirit Christ's broken body, the church, with your love, compassion, grace, mercy, comfort, and peace. Give to Christian people everywhere a deep longing to take up your cross daily, and to understand the love and its mercy. May we come to see the glory of our crucified Saviour, we pray. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. Bless those who lead this church's worship at this Passion time, Tom, Vanessa, Mark, and all our readers, in their faithful preaching, of your word and their reverent celebration of the sacraments. May they draw us all closer to you. May our response always be, I want to see Jesus. By the Saviour's cross and passion, in faith we pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. Strengthen those among us who are preparing, preparing for baptism, confirmation, and moving towards ordination, together with their teachers, sponsors and families. Teach them what it means to die and rise with Christ, and to prayer them, prepare them to receive more and more the breath of your Holy Spirit. By the Saviour's cross and passion, in faith we pray. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. Look in your mercy upon the world you loved. You loved so much that you sent your Son to suffer and to die, so that by believing in him we may have life in his name. Strengthen all of us to share this reconciliation, one of such a cross for us on the cross. May we follow the example of those women at the well and others to invite our families friends and neighbours to come and see Jesus this Easter tide. By the Saviour's cross and passion, in faith we pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bring healing by the wounds of Christ to all who are weighed down by pain and injustice, the poor, the hungry, the prisoners, be with those who bring your love and comfort to them. Help the lonely and the bereaved, the suffering and the dying, to find their strength in the companionship and friendship of Jesus. By the Saviour's cross and passion, in faith we pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Welcome into heaven all those who have recently left your world in your friendship, especially Arthur Harriet. According to your promises, bring us with them and all your saints to share in all the benefits of Christ's death and resurrection. By the Saviour's cross and passion, in faith we pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we rejoice in our fellowship with each other here and now, and with all the faithful departed, in your unfailing love for us 
and for, our, for all people, hear and answer our prayers through your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. To close our intercession, we pray together. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please would you stand? Once we were far off, but now in union with Christ Jesus, we have been brought near through the shedding of Christ's blood, for he is our peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. We offer one another a socially distanced sign of greeting. And then please be seated as I go to prepare the communion table. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift thanks to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is indeed right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks. Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. For as the time of his passion and resurrection draws near, the whole world is called to acknowledge his hidden majesty. The power of the life-giving cross reveals the judgment that has come upon the world and the triumph of Christ crucified. He is the victim who dies no more the Lamb was slain who lives forever, our advocate in heaven to plead our cause, exalting us there to join with angels and archangels, forever praising you and saying, Holy, 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 Holy Lord, Lord, God of power and might, heaven, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Accept our praises, Heavenly Father, through your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. And as we follow his example and obey his command, grant that, by the power of your Holy Spirit, these gifts of bread and wine may be to us the body and blood of our Saviour, Jesus Christ who, in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Therefore, Heavenly Father, we remember his offering of himself made once for all upon the cross, we proclaim his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension. We look for the coming of his kingdom. And with this bread and this cup, we make the memorial of Christ, your Son, our Lord. And so we proclaim, Christ, Christ has died, has died. Christ, Christ is risen, Christ, Christ will come, come again. Accept through him, our great high priest, this our sacrifice of thanks and praise. And as we eat and drink these holy gifts in the presence of your divine majesty, renew us by your spirit, inspire us with your love, and unite us in the body of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, through him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, with all who stand before you in earth and heaven, we worship you, Father Almighty, in songs of everlasting praise. Blessed, Blessed honour and, and glory be yours forever. Amen. Amen. 
And so let us pray, as our Saviour taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and give us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. We do not presume to come to this Lord's table as a Lord, but in your mind and thought of great mercies. We are not always much to gather the crumbs of your table, but you are the same Lord. His character is always to have mercy. For us, therefore, so you flesh your days on Jesus Christ and to drink his blood. And our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may ever more dwell in him and in him in us. Amen. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Blessed are those who are called to his supper. The body of Christ. Amen. The blood of Christ. Amen. And a prayer for those at home. Lord Jesus Christ, I believe that you are present now by your Spirit. Since I cannot receive wine, I pray that you will come spiritually into my heart. Let nothing ever separate me from you. May I live and die in your love. Amen. Amen. 